Hi, this is Karen at The Meaning Code, where we explore reality, searching for the metaphors that connect the frames. Today I'm going to be talking about Ira. He has some ideas about humility in science. Hi, Ira. I'm really looking Thank forward you. to our discussion on uh, science and humility, and I, I'm eager to hear your ideas. Uh, well, okay. I'll. I can start a couple different ways. Let me let me start it this way. Is certainly in the corner of the internet where your blog or podcast YouTube channel sits with Paul Vanderclay and the rest. There certainly has been this sense of the comparison of the worldviews of many different kinds of, say, faith-based, sorry, lots of Christians, but others, and then the kind of scientific materialism, some of the extreme ones, say, like, I would say the, one of the most, I would say, was Matt Delahanty, you know, for mm -hmm. example. But I think there, there's others. And, you know, what to think about that. It's it, almost in a way of thinking, you know, how did the, the discussions go? And I come at, come into that thinking about it from the sense of being a Christian, but I'm actually a working scientist. You know, it's, it's a lot of what I do for a living. You know, I've written a number of scientific papers, you know, and this kind of thing. So I'm in, in that world, I've been around and can add a few stories about it of what I think is going on there. But, I, but when I get to that and I listen to people like a Matt Delahunt, he was not a scientist as far as I know, or say even a Greta Thunberg or a, many people who use science to make their political arguments say, or any argument say, look, the science says this, we know that, thus whatever you're saying is false. Well. That's what I think is something to, to really hone in on because it's lacking, which is necessary. And I think really working scientists have it much, much more is some humility about what we know. And even in scientific discussions, when I hear we know that, what I would say is the consensus opinion of some part of scientists interpretation of the data is not we know that you know it, it's yeah. much more limited if you follow any kind of scientific history i mean you, you you see over and over again where the interpretation has changed and of course some of the great ones we know about are with uh copernicus or galileo and newton and and then um einstein etc you know those are big ones but all the time i think and we could talk about some of those uh aspects of, of of things there and and then also put that sense of humility in what i would say a, a greater cultural aspect a number of years ago and I, I i found the article i used to read the spectator from london all the time and it's, it's kind of a great magazine boris johnson used to edit of all people but it was better before him but there was an article from 2002 called making a virtue of vice and it basically was taking the virtues and the vices and comparing them and saying now in modern life, the vices are what we say are the good thing, <laughs> the old vices and the new virtues are something that's bad. So in a world of where everything is say self-esteem, that's a high order thing to achieve, then pride goes up as a value where humility is something you should avoid. It's, you know, it's almost like a, a mental problem they need to overcome. And so that's another aspect of, I think, the, the world you know, we're living in, and it affects science and scientists. Uh, and for other reasons this is going on, which we can get into, uh, at least I, I observe this, this kind of behavior. Well, okay, that gives us a good start. A um, lot of things yeah. to think about there. So um, I hear you talking about a couple of things there. One of them is consensus and what role consensus plays in coming to scientific discovery. And, um, and also 
one of the things that I is kind of on the periphery of my thought right now that I'd like to more, know more about is the whole issue of peer review. Because I noticed this was a, a big one, a big topic of discussion when Eric Weinstein had a conversation with his brother last week. Did you get a chance no. to hear that? Yeah, no, I thought that was really, uh, I don't want to say interesting like Paul Vanderklein, but <laughs> uh, that was an impressive conversation. And I passed, you know, mentioned this to other people because, you know, it, in this conversation, for those who haven't seen it, Eric Weinstein essentially accuses a Nobel Prize winner of gross academic fraud. Yes. Yeah. An issue is to say, well, but whether that whether that's true or not, there were be, because I mean, obviously that could really blow up. Yeah. But well, whether that's true or not, the thing that was really illuminating was his discussion of how peer review works. Well, there's peer review in, in the whole aspect. I took some notes actually on that conversation of Eric's contention of this disc, he was saying. I forget what he called disc. Distributed the, Information Suppression Complex. Di distributed Idea Suppression Complex. Oh, I that, oh distributed Idea yeah. Suppression so, Complex. So yeah, so we could get into that. Let's just maybe go follow that a little bit and I can give you some really nice anecdotes. So one of the things in there, either alluded to in that conversation, but it, you know, it's a big thing, the way science always worked in, in some sense, but now, especially with big science, for example, you have to have consensus when you're gonna spend a few billion on, on a Hadron Collider. Yeah. That, oh, this is a good thing to do. You know, so, so, there's, so in the sense of funding and where science is gone, there was a very fundamental change in science in the 20th century, but especially after World War II in the United States, where essentially the federal government took over science. So, and they took over economics and, and they take over, you know, all these things where the funding comes from the government, you know, where there's something like a National Science Foundation, there'll be a program officer who then collects proposals, they call for proposals, and people spend lots of effort in academics, very onerous tasks to write proposals and if you're starting off or you don't have the name, you know, you can write a dozen proposals and nothing gets funded or you're lucky to get one funded. And, and so, you know, what's going on there? I, thought, I just want to throw a couple things in there. One of the jobs that I had early in my career, um, which I got out of very quickly because it was unutterably boring, was putting together grant proposals. Grant proposals Absolutely. For That's a real job. Yeah. Or uh, I believe it was like an architectural firm or something like that, where they were they were looking to get some grants for city projects. Yeah. And um, the paperwork is so massive that one grant proposal would be like 500 pages long, and that was in the old days when you had to feed the sheets into the copy machine <laughs> one at a time. <laughs> Mail three copies or something. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing is, when you look at um, Richard Mitchell's book. Uh, less than words can say. He talks, this book came out probably 1980, maybe earlier, but he's talking about the degradation of the English language and how much of it has happened because how much of um, our, our life has been taken over by the government and the, all of these grant proposals are written in a certain kind of very obfuscatious language where everything is in the passive, everything becomes very um, passive. Uh, well, probably that's where the whole passive aggressive thing came from, but trying to hide what you're really asking for or trying to make it sound more intellectual than it actually is so that you can get the money, right? Well, there's a few things about getting the money and how that works. So here's, here's one anecdote. Uh, I did my graduate work at Duke and in the mechanical engineering material science department. And one of the stars, like the star I would say, was uh, at that time it was a young guy uh, named uh, Adrian Bijan. And, and you know, this is the kind of guy who's written 30 books, five or 600, 700 papers, I don't know. And, and 
he was very, very well known in, in the field of heat transfer. If you can get something sounding esoteric, but it's a big thing, heat transfer. It's all over, you know, this you know, thermal mm -hmm. processes and, and it's all in energy and all kinds of places. And at that time, the NSF program officer for heat transfer in some place that also was one of the very, very top academic engineers in this field was a guy named Ephraim Sparrow. And um, Sparrow came to Duke and was giving a talk about funding and things. So this is, you know, we're interested in these kinds of, everybody's interested in it. And he said in his, at that point, four or five years, you know, this is from memory, but it was striking, so I remember it. In my four or five years as the program officer at NSF, I've only funded one innovative project, and that was $50,000, you know, some relatively small grant for Adrian Bejan. And that, and that was it, you know. And, you know, you, you come away from that. Well, God, you're the program officer. Can't you do anything? But, you know, you, you, they're in a hierarchy. And it's like a bureaucracy. So to, to understand what happens, here's another anecdote. I had a friend, a friend, and he, he, well, he was at Duke, but then, you know, wasn't working and then ended up doing a PhD at North Carolina State. And in a really nice He's a really sharp guy, really innovative, and he started off at, uh, as a professor at Boston University, and he was talking about in precision uh, machining, precision, uh, I think it was precision machining is the term, but anyway, mechanical engineering kind of field, and he, was, he told me, he wrote like, you know, 10 of the, you know, hardest work, really innovative new proposals, you know, to, to get the funding, and then he came across, you know, the sort of the typical NSF program officer who said, yeah, you know, what, these are really nice, but, you know, I, I, can't you just give me a little bit more than you did on your, on your PhD uh, dissertation? So, in other words, it's always, and you'll hear this, they always want something to fund that they know will be a success. Mm -hmm. It's already done, usually. Right. For just a slight increment and otherwise they don't do it that's also why all the money goes to the big stars over and over again and you don't fund you know some new guy with an idea they almost don't even have enough ability to assess what would be really an innovative and great idea and so all this heavy funding and everybody has to follow the funding goes narrower and narrow in little channels associated with where that funding has been. And if you happen to catch a channel, you know, then you become great. And other times the channel turns and you're left like high and dry with nothing, no funding that, you know, that you don't fit. And then, then your career tends to go down to nothing because then you can't hire grad students, you know, and postdocs to do all the work and everything else. Well, there are some people who get to this really superstar status and I've seen them where there'll be something like 50 postdocs working for one professor. I mean, it's, it's a business. It's a you know, multi-million dollar business. It's not, you know, some guy sitting in a lab doing research. I mean, it's nothing like that. So anyway, those things, what happened with, with that and, and the need to get the funding, one is, you know, the innovative innovation isn't there, but also it's all reaffirming, you know, what the goal is of the funder. So you can't have things like, well, in engineering, you know, physics, that half of it's for the military or more. No. Well, you know, the, the same thing happens in the art world. It's the strangest thing, but if, uh, if an artist continues to be innovative, the galleries are not interested. The galleries, mm -hmm. where is the only place where you can make money, the galleries want something that's recognizably your style. So they will, they will continue to take your work if it looks like your work. And your work has to stay wherever it was when you started. Thomas Kincaid is a perfect example. He became a millionaire out of producing the same kind of work over and over and over and over again. He became a superstar. But it was the same kind of work with incremental changes. But the people who are really innovative, they're sitting in, a, in an attic someplace, <laughs> slaving away 
and and it doesn't show up until much much later you know well the thing is is i i in that sense you know one is the sense of entrepreneurship you know we've talked previously uh about some of the more you know aspects of economics and uh etc you know so what i would say is you know in as much as the art world is a market which we can look at that at least there it is distributed enough that there are hundreds of galleries maybe maybe they're all thinking the like they're all trying to make money but maybe it's because there's only these relatively small number of buyers who are then making decisions and they're not even buying it for the art it's only for an investment value that's probably the biggest reason or at least one of them i once met like a woman on a, on a plane and she was an art buyer purely for investments i mean mm. people were you know just just buying it and putting it in the safe and then selling it again in two or five years, you know, so. Well, so what's interesting is the way that there are sort of parallels between all these different worlds, though. So, so you just mentioned two things with the art thing. One side is that some people are buying strictly for the investment. The other side is that there are very few buyers. And I wonder if there isn't some parallel with that in, in, the, uh, in the science world where Perhaps that's why people have become so dependent on the on the federal government funding. Partly, because yeah, I think it. I think it came. To, I think the cart coming before the horse, or whatever the horse. It was the government really injected huge amounts of money into science. I mean, it's like winning World War II. The Manhattan Project is the classic example. Mm -hmm. You know, all the great physicists were working on that one thing. You know, you know, destructive use of, yeah. of atomic energy. So. I certainly think and you go back and read some of the history in more detail, you know, so I, I don't mean to make a thesis about it. I, that's what I think. And, and I think I could mount some evidence to make that case as much as anybody else would believe it. So in any case, that sense of then how people then have, you know, try to make it in the world as being a great scientist. There's this Eric Weinstein or Brett Weinstein and this and this Nobel Prize winner, who by Brett's description it sounded credible to me. You know, we didn't hear the other side of the story. I'm looking for that to come out one of these days. Yeah. Uh, you know, this was stolen, and and what's interesting was his brothers saying, you know, what? Why didn't you fight? You know, where was your pride essentially? You know, mm -hmm. you let this happen. And you shouldn't, you know, it's interesting that difference in personality be between the two, who both, I would say, I'm impressed, you know, they certainly are intellectually <laughs> pretty high level, very high level, uh, but also have, you know, the, the things that make the scientist, you know, name dropping and vocabulary. <laughs> you know, it's, so you know the vocabulary, you know, that's half of it. You know, who knows what they're doing? So that's another really part I'd like to get into about, you know, what all those guys are doing, you know, in this development. And you could look at also the other uh, talk with Eric Weinstein with Penrose, Roger Penrose. Yes, I was you know, just going to bring that up because there's two things about that. One is the way the scientists talk to each other. I love the introduction to that podcast where he talks about how, um, scientists talk to each other this way all the time in this very very complicated difficult language and we're not even really understanding each other all that well but yeah. we're doing the best we can and the second part of that um conversation that i thought was fascinating well several but one of them was when penrose talked about how most of the um most of the follow-on research has been done in the area of string theory because that was the sexy that was the sexy theory and everybody's jumped on that and he feels like they're wrong but all the energy has gone in that direction and none of the energy has gone towards the direction of his big idea which is twister theory and um, who knows it, it may not come out for hundreds of years which one if either of them is right but if everything is going one direction and there's only this one little peripheral player and nobody's paying any attention, what if that happens to be the right one? So, well, yeah. Curious. So but this is this is maybe always the case. It's just it's it's weighted a certain way where the weighting can come from the one funder. Say, I mean, there's not so many people doing string theory, or 
twister theory and, and where that funding is coming from that'll push the whole field is not so difficult. When you have big questions, say climate science or economic policy with the Federal Reserve, where they hire virtually every economist goes through their funding. You know? yeah. So we're not gonna say this is the whole institution is wrong. You know? So I, I think th that aspect of, of you know, this, this never ending funding and then the other part that comes out in the pride, I would say, you know, the sense of where's humility is, you know, to keep the funding going, a big part is public relations. And the public relations, if you read about, and one of the things, if you read anything in science in the newspaper, you can almost guarantee it's way overblown of what's being, you know, reported in the newspaper. And I have my own personal experience, like where we've done something and the public relations officer comes and says, oh, here's what I'm going to write about the paper you just published. And you go, are you kidding? This, this is, this is not, you, we have nothing like this. You know, we, we have a one little place where we're making a little contribution, a little potential contribution toward something. You can't say all these things. There's no way I, I could have my name on what you've written. And you know, you just knock it down like crazy. But if your bread and butter depends on it, you know, that's what you say. I mean, virtually everybody says how wonderful it is as opposed to, you know, in every good paper, scientific paper, there's a section about the limitations. You know, why this is not the whole story, why my data is not perfect, what I need, what needs to be done more, you know, what's going on with it. And I think for myself, my best scientific writing is probably writing limitations. Because that's really scoping the whole problem, you know, it's in the introduction and the limitations or part of the discussion, but that limitations part is say, look, from what we have, it suggests this, but we're obviously missing a big part. You know, we only, all the models, any model you ever do is missing something, you know, mm -hmm. whatever it would be. You know, we can go farther and farther of adding all the terms that might be involved. If you're talking about at least an empirical uh, experiment or, or even numerical model or something. So, in I think this is another driver of uh, leading the people to put out a front that is doesn't have the humility of saying, oh, sorry, you know, hold on here. You know, mm -hmm. our data is suggesting this, but like, don't change the whole economic system of the world and political economic system of the world based on this really sketchy idea, <laughs> which, you know, happens if it fits the right political case. So that happened with Piketty's research, right? Well, Piketty's that way, you know, as an economist, so it's 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 a kind of science, and again, it's another. Yeah, but, but a whole certainly of, again, it fits what everybody that. wants politically, so that goes up. Yeah. And I think the climate science uh, is 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 in that part myself, and that's you know not to get into all these other things. Um, in, the, so, in the area of quantum physics, I would say the person who's acting as a little bit of a release valve on that whole area of limitations is Sabine Hassenfelder because she often yeah. points out the limitations in in particular no you know when uh, when I first is that the news media just blows up way out of proportion yeah so when when um I first heard of string theory was in graduate school somewhere you know I was taking courses in the physics department and you know was was around and you see these things and you know the more they kept explaining it, you know, the more preposterous it seemed. I mean, so far from reality that I can, my relevance to realization, to you know, use the terms that we've been, you know, talking about, it, it just seemed unlikely, you know, just, there's nothing you could put your finger on it. And I think to me what it looked like, because I could see how this can happen in things I've worked on, is when you start taking a theoretical idea, and certainly when it becomes as abstract as a mathematical expression, there's always doing more math on it. So given this expression, if we take something that we take as a constant, like we live in a three-dimensional world, well, what if we made it a 10-dimensional world? What would happen? How could we make the math work out? And you can make something kind of interesting or beautiful in that way, but it really reminds me of that old thing. And I don't know how true it is they actually existed, but like the scholastics, you know, figuring out how many angels could dance on the head of a pin. You know, given the assumptions, let's follow them to the conclusion about what we're making. 
And if the assumptions are correct, you know, maybe that is what's going to happen. And I, that to me is things like string theory. You know, again, maybe somebody somewhere, I certainly don't have proof that it's wrong. I'm, I'm sort of happy is not the right word, but just feel, well, okay, at least some physicists, physicists out there recognize, hey, maybe we're going off the deep end here. And so seeing, seeing people like Sabina Hauser, not Sabina, what's her? Sabine Hassenfelder. Hassenfelder, I have a friend close to, with a name very similar to that. Uh -huh. And uh, so, you know, that's, that's another aspect of it uh, that I think comes, comes into play. There was one other thing I was thought I, I would just read, if I may, because I was, I, you know, if you, again, if you're following our uh, Pastor Vanderclay, you know, you end up putting more and more books, you know, on, <laughs> onto the list, and and the books are there, you know, and and uh, Savia King. I just was just about finished reading uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Mania, so which also is. Again, it's, it's talking about the same things of, of, you know, this separation of this materialism from other things and then what happens when people are in their own world and how they approach things. But this is, this is from C.S. Lewis's discarded image. So he says, you know, in every age, it will be apparent to accurate thinkers that scientific theories being arrived at in the way I've described are never statements of fact. This a little bit alludes to what I was saying earlier about we know that. That stars appear to move in such and such ways or that substances behave thus and thus in the laboratory. These are statements of fact. The astronomical or chemical theory can never be more than provisional. It will have to be abandoned if a more ingenious person thinks of a supposal which would save, in quotes, the observed phenomena with still fewer assumptions, or if we discover new phenomena, which it cannot save at all. This would, I believe, be recognized by all thoughtful scientists today. It was recognized by Newton if, as I am told, he wrote not the attraction varies inversely as the square of the distance, but, in, in quotes again, all happens as if it so varied. It was certainly recognized in the Middle Ages. In astronomy, says Aquinas, an account is given of eccentrics and epicycles cycles, on the ground that if their assumption is made, in Italian or uh, Latin, hack positon facta, if I'm pronouncing that right, the sensible appearance as regards celestial motions can be saved. But this is not a strict proof, in, in Latin again, sufficiente probum. Since for all we know, forte, they could also be saved, it's another Latin in parentheses, they could also be saved by some different assumptions. The real reason why Copernicus raised no ripple and Galileo raised the storm may well be that whereas the one offered a new supposal about celestial motions, the other insisted on treating this supposal as fact. If so, the real revolution consisted not in a new theory of the heavens, but a new theory of the nature of theory. So to me, you know, what this is, is, is getting at again is we put this in here, this is fact, and even more when those facts are, mar those theories are marshaled by, say, political sides to cut off debate, you know, and, and where they've taken, I, I would say, again, a sense of humility, for science and scientists, you know, some really, really big failures that have occurred over the last 20 or 30 years. And so a couple that, you know, we can go through many, I think, but say the food pyramid. You know, yes. that, this is a horrible thing. And this was the science. This is, this is, we know that. Good and hard. And, you know, it, it's a disaster, a real disaster. Uh, another one that's going on now, which I just even saw a talk about this, is the reproducibility crisis in, in science, mostly social science, but it's everywhere, I think, yeah. uh -huh. uh, where the, the, or replicability. I mean, there's different ways of defining this and how it might work. But it was interesting to me, and that's from the economics 
standpoint is the speaker who was uh, in studied education and things, so social scientist talking about it, he, uh, he mentioned at the early part of, you know, what is like the gold standard of how to do the science or what the data is. And I point out in the question to him or a comment to him was, well, you know, in economics, in monetary policy, there is no more gold standard. The government can do whatever they want to make out what's true money. They can create it out of nothing. And we can go through and say, what is the standard by behavior in any aspect of life today? You know, and certainly going through academia of, well, we could take the postmodern view that nothing is true, but that implies like the results are not true, but it also applies about, well, whatever behavior works, you know, it's good if it goes. If the data is accepted, you get your paper into nature, you know, more than likely nobody's going to test it. And, you know, there you go. So I think, you know, these, these, that's a certain, you know, for me, carries on this issue of as a scientist talking to a lay audience to say, like Matt Delahanty, well, everywhere where science has come against theology, it's always been science has been correct, is way lacking in, way too much pride in and lacking of the humility to understand it's a provisional understanding of the truth, certainly if it's a, a big theory about, you know, the way the world is, and certainly a theory about people. I think even, pe I've heard Jordan Peterson say things like, you know, if your child is not socialized at four years old, forget. Well, you know, that's a pretty stark statement. You know, that's it, huh? So we might as well just send the kid off to prison or something, you know, right away because there's no chance. It, it always seems, especially certainly in the social sciences, the human sciences, I think more complicated. And this can get to, you know, we've talked uh, previously about uh, some of my experiences with my brother and mental illness. I think one of the things that was extremely important and striking about dealing with the psychiatric profession was one is the use of their, uh, the pharmacopoeia of that, which I thought the science, the papers I read were, were, were very limited and very poor for the whole aspect of what they were doing. And the whole aspect of trying to quantify behavior. And if you look across the spectrum where you're trying to get a, you know, a new medicine and you're trying to show, prove it works in some type of, type of way that you know, we can think of mental illness, but we could also think of things like for helping people with pain, helping people with Parkinson's disease, um, anywhere where there's behavior, you know, people after a stroke. Well, measuring, quantifying behavior is notoriously really difficult. Mm -hmm. you know, like pain studies, are, like 97% of them are never satisfy some aspect of significance because it's so noisy. And if you think about it, you know, how, can, is all kinds of scales, asking questions, other things. There are other ways of trying to do that. But it's, it's in, this, in the sense of psychiatry, I, I would say, and I can point to some evidence I've seen of people finally recognizing it, it is really a failure. I mean, it's, it's something that we shouldn't do. It, it points in the right, and, and as far as I can see, it really wasn't practiced you know, day to day in the clinic with my brother, though it's the basis of this, this enormous pharmacopoeia that has. I think quite a lot of dangers to it in the way it's uh, prescribed. Wouldn't it be the same kind of problem that, um, well, let's say in, in climate change, you run into the same problem that when something, when, when uh, a result does not fit the model, they don't look at that result. They, they, only, yeah. they only acknowledge the results that fit the model or come close enough to the model that, that it can come into that frame. Yeah, well, that that's, could be, a, there's another aspect of modeling that you could, I'm talking about taking empirical evidence. In mm -hmm. other words, if you want to say, hey, if you do this treatment, you'll have less pain. It's like, well, how, how do you quantify pain? And there's all kinds of wild ways of doing it, including mm -hmm. just asking, is this more painful or less painful? And, and 
if you think about keeping doing that over any period of time mm -hmm. among many different people you know you could be g gordon liddy and you know you put your hand over a candle to show how tough you are versus you know any little touch you know so so or it's kind of like are, the, the optometrist and they say is it which one is better one or two one or two now is it two or three by the time they get to three or four i'm like i don't know yeah. Yeah. That's a little bit different again, because I, I think you can be, you know, there's a much more objective measure about what you say there, but I would, it's interesting you say that because I think if you really looked hard at it and studied it, you probably find that there is a subjective factor. Oh, it's very, it's very, very subjective. It's very subjective because you're looking at the same set of letters. He's just changing the lens a little bit to make it a little bit, this kind of focus or that kind of focus they're both a kind of focus but they're just different kinds of focus and uh, yeah well it also i guess any kind of seeing is also interpreted by your brain in a certain way but right. at least there's something there that if you're thinking it that way with that lens it to your head it seems to be showing up better at least the way you're saying it at that time but i don't know if you, that day you come in with a, you know it's a bad day if you did the same test on the same person you know each week for 10 weeks, would you always get, and done by the same person behind the device, would you always get the exact same prescription? You know, yeah. that's the kind of thing where there's the human part of all, all our data. You know, I think- the, Well, and isn't that the different problem? Than the quantitative that's problem. why everything, everything is complex. It's, it's because everything, our, our essence is everywhere in the universe. <laughs> Yeah. Well, um, and I, I want to just pull us back a second to what you said about a new theory about theory, and that mm. what or Lewis said that. Well, what what theory actually is is a, a provisional understanding of the truth, and you were talking about ways in which this impacts the political environment, ways in which it impacts or or that there are political reasons for this, there are financial reasons for this. And I also think that, um, I'm not quite sure how to frame this, but have you ever seen the, uh, the speech that Nima Arkani Hamed did at Cornell when he was talking about the morality of fundamental physics? I don't think so. I don't recall okay. that. Well, it, it's, I'll, I've been working on trying to make a transcript of it. It's like an hour and a half long and mm -hmm. typing out a transcript is taking an immensely long time. But, but I think it's that important that I've been trying to make a transcript of it. But one of the things that he talked about in there was that during the era of Newtonian, uh, the Newtonian understanding of the way the universe worked, he said, it's as though there is this beautiful there's this mountain and from that mount, mountain top there's this beautiful view of the way the universe works it's so crystalline so perfect so morally sublime it's complete and it does the job as well because it it told us how to get to the moon and all of the things that we were able to do based on this newtonian perspective of how the universe functions but then later on, when we come to Einstein, and then we begin to see um, general and special relativity, it's a taller peak with a broader perspective, and it's beautiful and complete, but it's, it, it didn't subsume the original mountain. The original mountain is still there, it's still crystalline, it's still perfect, it still is doing what it needs to do, and it's still as important as it ever was, but now there's this new mountain of beauty and truth and morally perfect truth that's there. But that doesn't mean that that's the final mountain. There, will, there may be other mountains, but so many scientists come to the place where they think, well, now we have this mountain peak, that's all we need, we're done. This is the perspective we need. But you actually need some kind of a meta perspective where you get up above. At least that's the picture I got when he was talking. That you well, that's certainly I think Lewis's point. Hmm? That's Lewis's point in in in, yeah. in his in that little piece I read. I would say in that sense, an, another aspect that I was going to bring up with this is in the hierarchy. You know, and the physicists are on the top of the hierarchy, and the science is on top 
of the social sciences and and on top of the world you know and say you know how did that hierarchy happen i would say you know it's that's where the science like i would say is and this is i think a, to me an issue when we talked about this when we were with carl the distinction between say engineering or technology and science and the, the technology has you know has brought with it tremendous wealth and power which flips the hierarchy or it makes the people control it on top but the science really wasn't a part of that until much later and i would say only in certain fields for example i mean virtually anything you ever touch except maybe some really fancy thing going on inside your your laptop or something it's still newtonian mm -hmm. you know, you know, you're flying a plane newtonian you know etc like that and even i once was looking you know where was the first time even equations were used to to optimize something in engineering and the first i could find of it was using trust theory for bridges in in the us say in the 1840s or 1850s so you know cathedrals were built without engineering science you know the it's experience you know this empirical way of doing things and certainly you know steam engines were getting built automobiles were starting to be built without all the fundamental thermodynamics and all the other stuff worked out and i would say even the optimization has always followed either been empirical to begin with certainly there are step changes by understanding better like in, in aerodynamics you know there was a real fundamental understanding change of boundary layer theory that came and went from you know in the really old biplanes you would see wires holding everything together and the flow over the wire so called separates you know the flow becomes turbulent say behind the wire and that's if you make an airfoil shape you can actually make like a 40 times size the diameter in an airfoil shape compared to a, a, a cylindrical round cylindrical wire and have the same resistance you know, so this was something where that was coming from some fundamental understanding but still a model it's not the whole story for sure and that's driving it but i would say still a heck of a lot a lot of the technology technological growth has been relatively low level science or even no science just empirically testing things you know like like edison would do you know i don't know if edison had any theoretical basis for what he was doing he was always had some ideas and tested everything so you're like crazy you're, so so i'm letting this wash over me and getting as much as yeah. i can and what i hear you doing is distinguishing between empirical and theoretical is somewhat that, yeah is that right and just the sense of technological development is really what brought you know the industrial revolution technological development those things that not only people took on and started to use but brought those people to the top of the hierarchy because they control so much wealth and power after those things were developed but i would say is those were mostly empirically intuition and entrepreneurial based things that brought them to power but now it's the scientists who are in control the technocrats and if you read again in the there's a lot of literature in the 30s and 40s and 50s about this technical managerial revolution who was that uh, uh burnham i think you know he was a national review editor wrote about the managerial revolution this sense of who's in charge now that could include engineers but the technocrats are coming to the top and saying okay you know this is the problem of the world this is how you do it this is what food you should eat this is how you should move around this is how you live well so you're you're combining the the technological with the bureaucrat is that what you mean yeah so this is the sense of now is again in healthcare and i mean everywhere i would say is, is this is this is what's happened and science as scientists you know they can be come top of you know in a way the top of a hierarchy having it, tremendous power usually it's through politics but you know those guys set, uh -huh. the, set the tone i mean somebody's there telling us you know you can't 
drink soda pop or you got to, you got to, you got to do this. I mean, anything, you know, that's, they're, they're telling people how to live. Right. So is this that going back to the, the root cause of it, do you think it's an excess of abstracting, abstraction, over systematizing, well, over categorizing? It, that could be. I mean, this is certainly uh, the the Zen uh, and the art of motorcycle man. This um, Persig, you know, his his that's part of his concept of what's going on. This Aristotelian classifying everything, breaking it apart, and talking about it. And and this could be also the McGrillkist left brain, right brain. I guess what I'm trying to say is is really something much much more simple than that with everything we've been talking about is given all these issues, given the scientists are not these isolated, pure truth searching beings, but are meshed in the humanity full of politics and, and economics and all these other things, and so many other failures of it, you know, not just looking at how wonderful science is, that they just should be more humble. A guy like Delahanty shouldn't be able to say, Oh, well, science is always right, and not saying, get out of here. That is too ridiculous of a statement. That's not worthy of a real discussion. And it's a bit of, you know, Pinker gets that way a bit. I mean, Sam Harris, I suppose. I haven't listened to those guys too much. But just be a bit more humble, huh? <laughs> you know, you're not, you don't got it, the whole world figure out, and everybody knows it. You know, stop it already. Well, did, did you, uh... Did you watch Paul's, it was the video he put out yesterday, I believe. Um, he's doing a kind of one of his analysis videos and he has some snippets in there from Jordan Peterson answering questions at Lafayette College. Oh uh, yeah, I did see that one, yeah. A couple of the, yeah. Okay, so one of the young men asked him a question. Um, he's working on an honors thesis about Indo-Persian poetry or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. This poet who says that that the hidden reality he a, he asks the hidden reality to make itself known in the robes of metaphor because that's the only way that we can perceive. That's the only way that we can perceive actual truth is in yeah. the, the metaphor. But and, I really got to thinking about that because if you put that together with everything that Jordan Peterson has taught and then put that together with what Ian McGilchrist is trying to say, that is that, that we have, now I suppose Persig would call this the flow state, but. Well, he wasn't flow state, he was more the quality. He was, Persig was the one with the quality. So what, what, but the way that, that he notices the quality and the way that um, metaphor makes the way that metaphor reveals the hidden reality is this this moment that that we are on the edge of between the known and the unknown. Um, in 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 my next moment, the future is going to arrive to me, and in my next moment, I have to make a choice out of this field of infinite potential, and. Um, what McGilchrist says, which seems to me to fit together perfectly with what Jordan Peterson is talking about, is that at that moment when you have to make a choice, you need an aim, you need a focus, because that brings things into your field of vision that you can choose. But it is, according to McGill McGilchrist, it's the job of the right hemisphere to have its feelers out into this field of the unknown, sort of like in a flow state when it's a little misty maybe, you're at the margins, it's unclear what is important, but certain things will rise up in this field that become, that get on your, what my mother used to call the apperception mass, sort of make little <laughs> connections. Yeah, yeah. Make little connections. And then, it, the right hemisphere sends that information to the left hemisphere. The left hemisphere's job is to systematize that, categorize it, make some sort of sense out of it, uh, use it to maybe create a tool or a way to manipulate the world 
or to find a focal point. And then it sends that information back to the right hemisphere and, and the right hemisphere re-globalizes it, recontextualizes this new finding into, so that you can move ahead into the world. Now that makes perfect sense to me, but I've had some folks arguing with me. <laughs> well, really I would put it a little bit different, not different, but just segregated a little bit, just to say is certainly it seems to me, and it really came, came first for me, because I really didn't study psychology very much at all, starting to follow Peterson and talking about this frame issue. And it makes perfect sense. And once you have a sense of where the frame is and mm -hmm. how the frame can is is split in different ways, however that would be, yeah, it's clear. When you get to the point, well, is there the right doing this and the left doing this and it's marginalized and all that, I tend to have more just, well, maybe, but to me, anytime you're talking about what the brain's doing, you know, you're not taking a blood, you know, these images and other things. You know, there's some of the issues of some of the people who have strokes and things like that that are, you know, pretty they're interest certainly really interesting and 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 seem credible. But what I would just say in terms of this conversation is, yeah, this is really complicated. You know, for me as an engineer, yeah. <laughs> teaching engineers, I would say is like, well, you know, engineering, you should treat it like a humanity. That is whoever's going to build your design is a human being you know they have strengths they have weaknesses they have other things and you should have that in mind if in your shop is a great welder or a great machinist you should design whatever you're doing in a different way to join two pieces of metal mm -hmm. and then it's going to be used by human beings and who are those people how do they think what's going on so those should be two aspects continually on your mind and those things are fuzzy they're in this realm of how do you really understand how do you understand really what yourself is thinking let alone your your spouse let alone your children i mean we can't hardly predict you know things we think we should really know about let alone everybody who's going to use our product so that should make us humble you know so um what's his uh, roebling you know who did the brooklyn bridge and everything else you know you read about his his ethic and it was just testing 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 always doubt you know, how's this going to work it's those guys that, hey here's another great design you know everything's that you know literally falls apart and collapses so that's it back again i was what i say is you know hey let's be humble let's you know as an engineer you're always doubting yourself mm -hmm. in the sense of am i sure what's my factor of safety you know what am i what's my uncertainty in what am i what i'm doing you know to, to make it make it work well and then there are all these other layers that get added on to it because even if you have say done you, you personally have done the research the due diligence you've got it figured out you've got the great idea and um so for example in my husband's role he he's in technology and he is a he works with product and one of his jobs is to come up with what the product should look like in the future and and convey it to engineering so that they can put it together, okay? Well, he can have the greatest product that would absolutely revolutionize the industry and legal says, well, now wait a minute, that piece of it might get us into trouble over here and this piece of it, we're not quite sure about that, so it's gonna take us a year to research this and figure it out. Well, by the time you get around to getting legal on your side, the moment is gone, that piece of technology is gone. And I'm certain that the same thing happens in the field of science. Maybe peer review plays the role of legal, or maybe peer review has all the problems that um, that Eric, Wein Eric and Brett Weinstein were talking about, where the people, peer review is people. <laughs> and those well, you know, have their own agenda. They talk specifically about nature and, you know, I'm been on a couple of teams, you know, we, people want to, you know, submit to nature, you know, and it's, it's, they're real pain because, you know, they have like a backward kind of paper style, you know, the methods come at the end, you know, which is kind of strange. And then it's not really peer reviewed in the sense they have a 
professional editors of some kind that then decide and mm -hmm. and there's you know there's there's a lot of classic things that you know nature or science turned down and it's it's you know the, the, that sort of goes with it but certainly almost anybody's put in enough papers have had reviews which was what Weinstein was talking about with the one he thought was by this competitor but doesn't necessarily have to be by this competitor or the person who wanted to put his idea down mm -hmm. um, not understanding what you're doing certainly criticizing the paper not your paper but the paper they wanted they would rather have you know, yeah example or yeah. just not you know saying well this has already been done or you know with no citations or no context or, or something like that or just missing you know what the argument is and i had one case like that where it is rare you know i say oh man i just have to respond to this you know and did my five or six seven page, you know whatever pages of response and just sent it in but it was not to change anything because i knew nothing would change but sometimes you just gotta <laughs> you gotta get it out of your system you know yeah and, and but usually it's just better you just throw it you know go to another journal i mean you know, that that happens a lot especially you know again the name means something so there's some journals a handful that i can get any paper i want in you know pretty much and then others that you know it's like almost impossible you know no matter how good the paper is or something and obviously one like that is nature but i mean in your field there's some better better ones than that let's if your name is not known you really got to fight and part of it's because also each subfield you know little narrow bit has a way of talking about things using vocabulary in a certain way and if you don't get that right they're going to jump on that that's that vocabulary bit you know mm -hmm. it, it's really an important thing the way the science is done and what seems very complicated it'd be like listening to another language is complicated but it's not complicated that people know the language I mean, it's just normal so you know that's part of it and I, I guess one other topic just really quick just to discuss because you brought it up you know with uh i thought penrose you know what was interesting about him and so much of what science is about certainly physics is be able to comprehend complex forms in your head and you can see i mean he's an artist but he, Mm -hmm. If you heard him many times, he said, well, you can see that. I mean, he could see it, but he had this, he has an extraordinary, I mean, just incredible vision of reality in multiple dimensions that he can put out and even draw it in artistic ability. That's incredible. And this is something I was teaching once a course where part of it was teaching mechanical drawing. I don't know if you know that, you know, you, so you have an object and you look at it from, you know, front view, top view, side view. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I was trying to learn how to teach it. And I was looking up, well, how do you teach that? And you say, imagine the object is turning in three dimensional space. And for, I would say in the classes I had, five to 10% couldn't believe like this was actually something you had to teach because it was so obvious. It was just, of course. There was another 5%, 10% that would never be able to do that. They cannot think in three-dimensional space. And then the bulk of the people could have an idea, but would make mistakes and you know, you had to practice and look at it and you know, figure out how to do hidden lines, figure out how to construct this, these kind of shapes, so they, they, when they turn right, especially you know things that are curved or things that are on angles. So there was you know some kind of fundamental uh, skill to develop that way, and then they'd be okay, and then you know they could do the basic stuff. But that sense of what you can understand in three dimensional, then when you get to these things that are way abstract, because there are multi-dimensional, say that Penrose though he could see them. I mean, he could, he could imagine that in his head, you know, that's, that was what's amazing about what he was, was doing, but what's special about it, but it, it is that visualization of it. And, you know, so anyway, 
I mean, maybe that's a little bit bit off topic. Just I, I thought there was lots of nice things in the in the Penrose uh, interview. Oh yeah, and, I love that. Uh, I want to go back and listen to it again and see how much more I get the second time. Yeah, I, here's one line that from Weinstein: you know, "The intellectual carnage of string theory." <laughs> I like that. You know. Well, and I beautiful like mathematics that. has no bearing on the physical world. You know, tolerating the system. So I mean, there's all those things come together, but Anyway, just my main point in terms of talking about science, because I would say, and the reason I thought about it with you is because I think you're somebody who really has an appreciation for science. And you look for science to inform how you understand faith or understand economics, say, or all kinds of things. And I would say even then is like, well, okay, yeah, sure. But also, it's not all the answers you know they should they should have more humility in the way they bring forward in, in saying this quantum mechanics states well let's really look at that what it really is saying is proving in our everyday life that there's infinite number of parallel worlds i don't think it's come up and proved that the mathematics says that might be the case but mm -hmm. <laughs> that's me. That's that's like you can make the math work to get that result, like Lewis was saying. But well, see, there may I be lots think, of other explanations. I think that just in the same way that you can that that I can use science to inform other areas of my knowledge base. I think there are other areas of other realms of knowledge that can be used to inform science. For and sure. I, I've used this example before about the particle physics. Uh, professor that was talking about how she had done all this research on um, synthetic particles and that if you keep removing the space from the particles, eventually they will form themselves into a perfect crystalline structure. And she said, and that is based on entropy alone. Nothing else was added. Entropy alone caused this to happen. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, no, it wasn't entropy alone you change the boundary lines on those particles. That, that's an outside force changing the boundary. And I'm, I recognize that because of art and how important mm -hmm. boundary is in art. And I think that, that every system has something to offer to other systems, but the people who are in the scientific system tend to think our system is total. We don't need to look outside of our system for any other information. And there's another couple of ways that I thought of that it just impinges on the whole humility issue. And one of those is a scientist might think he's completely objective, but he doesn't understand that the very choice of what he's decided to study is a subjective choice from him. Yeah. And so, so what if all people, and, and it's a very human thing, what if all the people who are in the science field right now have neglected some very important choice. That means that the thing that really needs to be being studied right now is not being studied. So you can't say it's a completely objective behavior. Well, I, think, I think that's the sense of the humility comes also is we are finite beings. We, we can't know the whole world. I think it was somewhere I just saw Jonathan Peugeot, you know, mm -hmm. saying the scientists said we can know everything. And then they posted, <laughs> As initial value problem, you know, Laplace was the one. Give me the initial conditions, and I can save the world. But what's left out there is the world is not an initial value problem; it's an initial boundary value problem. And the boundaries, we don't even know what they are. They're complex. They're, you, know, you can say complex or not. Just we don't even know what they are is going on at the boundary that then affects what happens throughout the system. So. As we're going out into infinite, you know, we don't know what's out in infinity somewhere, which is part of the boundary. You know, for hyperbolic problems, they continue to go, but in general, we have boundaries. And so one of the things we have in fluid mechanics is, you know, this transition to turbulent flow. And you go, well, if the flow is low enough inertia, it goes over the boundary smoothly. But the boundary is always so complex eventually at some point the flow gets tripped up going across what is roughness the roughness could be the size of molecules but 
somewhere there's roughness that will go turbulent. And in the modeling, we can never model all that turbulence, you know, the wall in all its complexity. And so you end up doing something that's statistical. You know, the, most of the solutions to turbulence problem is an empirical statistical value that you reinsert into the model to take account for this issue of, we don't know what the boundary is. The, re, the interaction of our system with the boundary that we don't know what it is. You know, in, in reality, at least my interpretation of that would be. So it comes again to, you know, we are finite. We have that limited view. We can say the right brain, left brain, you can see everything else, what's there. And we have it there in understanding science. And I think though we could look at it, even though in our faith as well, you know, in the sense of, so I was reading another blog somewhere where it's talking about, you know, what is, what is that we're supposed to do? And it was, you know, Jesus said, what's the first thing is to love God and the second thing to love others. But to me is, you know, well, what do you do? I mean, if I love God more than anything else, am I supposed to not feed my kids? And if I'm, I have my kid that's doing something, am I never supposed to punish them or give them everything that they want? Or how much of those, both of those things should I do in the most love I could give? I don't know. It's a work in progress. I don't know the end boundary condition. You know? <laughs> What's going to happen? And so even when theoretically we know and believe in it from faith or from science, it's so more complex than we can imagine that we we got to be humble about it. You know, look, I'm going to try my best. This is what I think is going to work. The science points me in this particular direction. But if I say that's true, does it imply that I can predict everything about how it affect human activity and the whole environment and the economy and politics? to make some statement that this has to be done tomorrow and nothing else, like Greta Thunberg at 16 <laughs> years old? You know, I don't think so. You know, that, that I think you know, we, we don't know enough to say, and this is back again of the libertarian view of, and even we could talk about the, the faith view, anywhere the power becomes too concentrated as human beings, you're looking for trouble, be it, the Catholic Church too powerful in the 16th century, or the United States today, or atomic weapons, or our ability to control the environment, supposedly, you know, in some ways. Okay, that's one thing I can say is if power is accumulating somewhere, I'm I don't want to keep that going. If somebody says to me, which they say all the time, the world's gonna end, be scared, and give all your wealth and power to me and I'll protect you, which is almost all of what politics is today. <laughs> I say, I, I think I'll just keep gold and, <laughs> under the mattress, you know. That, that's a good place to finish up, I think. Yeah, I think so. I think I've said so, about everything. I so you, about want, but you said something that was so fascinating to me that I would love to have a follow-up conversation about it, if possible you were talking about transition to turbulent flow mm -hmm. and the problems, the problems that come up when you're trying to determine how things are affected by even the smoothest surfaces and so forth. And when you get, I think you said when you get to a low enough inertia and you also said Earlier, you said something was an initial value problem, not an initial value problem, but an initial value boundary problem. Or initial boundary value problem. You know, so in other words, when you're stating the problem in okay. a... In a but, but I would like to, I'd like to have a longer conversation about those two things, because I think they're both absolutely fascinating and that there would be a lot that we could get into there, which we probably don't have time to get into right now. Yeah, certainly not today. I mean, it it takes some. We have to maybe think about the best way to present those things. I mean, those are sort of the classic engineering techniques. You know, coming out of the 19th century into the majority of the 20th century, mm -hmm. of these are the things. You know, we describe the world by partial differential equations, typically, or differential equations. And when you have partial differential equations, you have then you can have initial conditions and boundary conditions and they both have to be stated the same equation can describe 
everything from a boat to an airplane to a, a, a small uh, one-celled animal to everything in terms of, say, the fluid mechanics. But the initial conditions are different and the boundary conditions are different. And we can talk about fluid properties as well. And then our scope of dealing with it and fluid mechanics was, you know, the math was so difficult, each thing was separated to try to get at what you could solve so, a certain class of problems. But oh, it's always been limited. You know, now with computational methods, we're closer to kind of treating most types of real world problems. But even there, there's a lot that I would say is, you know, it's not always well done anyway. Well, so I know this, uh, one of my best friends is a, is a professor of public choice economics. She came out of George Mason University, so she totally is in the Austrian economics world. And uh, I wouldn't call them Austrian, but anyway. Well, okay. The Buchanan, the, uh, um, the uh, Tyler Cohen, and all this is... Uh, I think it would be a very interesting conversation to have you and her talk about this whole issue of initial conditions and boundary conditions, because for her, that's the one of the most important things that she teaches her students hmm. is how to. Okay, well, maybe we'll, we we can maybe deal with that offline sometime. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just think it would be an interesting discussion. If you don't, if you'd rather not, then we. You no, 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 no. Just in terms of, standpoint of topics and things for future conversation, I think we can yeah. deal with it after the recording. Yeah. Okay. That sounds All good. Right. So I'm going to write down the, the ideas for our next conversation. I'll probably put it in the notes so we don't lose it <laughs> as yeah. we move forward in time. And uh, Thank you so much for the generosity well, thank you. of your time and all yeah. your ideas. And uh, it's really been good seeing you again. Yep. Okay. Till next time. Yeah. Thanks, Ira. Bye-bye.